Okay, so our next speaker is Sally Kawamura. So we have Sally there. Um, Sally is an art historian whose interests lie in 1960s Japanese experimental communities. And in particular, her doctoral thesis, Objects into Action, Group Ongaku and Fluxus, it looked into the reasons and similarities and connections between avant-garde practices in Japan, Europe, and America. So, which is, of course, very, very central to the questions of this, uh, this conference. And she's going to speak with us today about Miyoko Shiomi and questions of boundaries. Hello, Sally. I'm going to be talking about um, Miyako Shiomi and Boundaries. So my presentation is called On the Edges of Shadows, Miyako Shiomi and Boundaries. I've spent quite a bit of time recently staring at the edges of shadows because I've been trying to find out something about Miyako Shiomi's concern with boundary states. She's produced a lot of pieces exploring the idea of boundaries. And in this presentation, we'll look at some of her works to address the questions, what is a boundary and why does it matter? Miyako Shiomi was born Chieko Shiomi in 1938 in Okayama, Japan. She's known for her intermedial and interactive works exploring the boundaries between media, self and nature and for co-founding one of the earliest free improvisational groups called Group Ongaku, which means group music. She's an active part of the Fluxus Network. Um, she spent time with fellow Fluxus Associates in New York from 1964 to 5. And she's also organized and participated in several Fluxus e related events in Japan. As Mijuri Yoshimoto pointed out in her talk yesterday, um, discussion of the work and background of Japanese artists has been scarce in Fluxus studies. This is partly due to the language barrier and also due to a pervasive Eurocentric perspective, which is now being challenged. Um, it's been too easy to assume that the work of Japanese artists in Fluxus was the result of a direct influence from Western artists and musicians, especially John Cage. Also, on the other hand, their work is sometimes exoticized. It's a huge and a much needed project to closely study the backgrounds and works of artists from countries that have been regarded as peripheral to the, to the centre, um, looking at their own concerns and disentangling them from westernisation and exoticisation. I'm now going to look at some of Xiaomi's works including the background to them. Um, I'm exploring her work involving boundaries and what effect it has on us as viewers and participants. I'm going to present a boundary condition as a state that Shiomi uses partly to bring about a sense of expansiveness and imaginative possibility. The first piece we'll look at is Shadow Piece 2 from 1964. It reads, Project a shadow over the other side of this card. Observe the boundary between the shadow and the lighted part. Become the boundary line. As Mijuri Yoshimoto has previously pointed out, um, Shiomi's own translation of the third part of the instruction was creep into the boundary. But George Machunas um, hadn't quite understood this and he changed it to become the boundary line. But Shiomi isn't too keen on this translation because it's further away from what she meant. In an email to me, Shiomi explained how the piece was inspired and how it relates to her love of the natural environment. Um, she said, after a while, I started to be concerned about the boundaries um, between where the light hits and where the shadows are. It's not a line that separates A and B, but rather a brackish water area 
a place where seawater and river water mix, like the Takahashi River, where I used to play every day in the summer. I began to think that it might combine elements from A and B, or perhaps it might be the entrance to a completely different space, end quote. My question is, what is this space and how do you enter into a boundary? Shiomi told the researcher Toshia Kakinuma, truth be told, I thought of the boundary line like a horizon. So in my imagination, I wanted to wander into a space of a different dimension that spreads in between. The horizon is prominent in Shiomi's mirror piece, as I found when I tried performing it. It reads, stand on a sandy beach with your back to the sea. Hold a mirror before your face and look in it. Then step back to the sea and enter into the water. Looking in the mirror, I did feel what Shiomi meant when she asserted that the piece demonstrates a merge with nature because I felt part of an expanse, walking backwards towards the boundary line, the horizon. And the edge of a shadow for Shiomi is a natural place where expansiveness can be experienced. She's written, a shadow's outline changes according to the strength of light or distance from the light. It can be blurred or sharp like a razor blade. It doesn't matter, and this is on the slide, it doesn't matter what kind of boundary, but if you stare at it, you'll see the splitting of dimensions and a distant, expansive space. All you have to do is enter into it. At that time, the observer should be free and quiet, as if floating. At a time like this, their hearing may open up unexpectedly. They start to hear noises, that they didn't notice before, as if they're hearing it for the first time in ages." End quote. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I've spent quite a while over the past months um, looking at the edges of shadows. And as I did so, I found that I became more aware of incidental environmental sounds as I concentrated my mind on that edge. Um, on the boundary. Um, and I found that in this way, uh, my perceptions were heightened and expanded. The edge sometimes looks a little bit different the more I look at it, and the boundary less certain. And this piece, Boundary Music from 1963, also asks us to look for an uncertain edge. It emphasizes the search for a boundary between sound and no sound. It reads, make your sound faintest possible to a boundary condition, whether the sound is given birth to as a sound or not. At the performance, instruments, human bodies, electronic apparatuses, and all the other things may be used. In an email to me, Xiaomi has talked about the background to composing this piece. And she says that after she finished her studies and she'd been improvising with Groupon Gaku in Tokyo, she returned home to her parents' house in Okayama. And at that time, she was very concerned with the idea of the boundaries between sound and no sound or existence and non-existence. And she was thinking deeply and seriously about these issues. But she's been interested in the end point of sound for many years. And she told me in another email that as a child, she had a piano teacher that used to ask her to hold on to the notes until the sound faded away. And she then related this um, herself to how things in nature also fade away. Um, I've experienced boundary music in two ways. One is performing it privately to myself and the other is watching performances of it on video. As a performer, I noticed that when I touched the objects to try to make a faint sound, I was so much more aware of how they felt to touch 
than if I was focusing on trying to create a louder sound with them. And in this way, I felt my sense of awareness and um, my senses expanded. Different performances I've watched have been set up in different ways, either focusing on the very nascent sound that's produced or designed as a game, emphasizing play. And the improviser and musicologist David Toop in his book, Into the Maelstrom, um, refers to the psychologist D.W. Winnicott in situating play in a boundary space, um, a space full of potentiality or possibility between people and their environment. And he then goes on to relate this to the experience of improvising musically. Um, in a film of a David Toop workshop exploring this score, Boundary Music, um, one participant said that for her, um, using the score, Boundary Music, would evoke sounds in the imagination of the audience. So we're looking at boundaries, including but not limited to between imagination and perception, performer and audience, and the physical matter of objects in each other and evoking effects in the imagination of our audiences significant in Shiomi's work. Part of an expansive feeling can be a feeling of space and endlessness, um, infinity like in drone music like Lamont Young's, but another way of creating an expansive feeling is by creating a sense of possibility you're between one state and another, and there's an ability to grow or to transform. And in this piece, Shadow Event Number Y, the reader um, is to create a shadow of the word shadow from a plastic film onto the pages of the booklet with the torch that's provided. It creates a sense of what's possible versus impossible or real versus unreal. Um, there's a gap between real and unreal as we project the real or unreal shadow that's represented as a word on the film to make a real or unreal word in shadow form on the pages and a gap between possibility and impossibility as we're asked in the pages to do things like nourish it and steal it. The shadow changes the book and it makes it a site for active play rather than something to read passively. We have something in front of us that we can't nourish or steal, um, though we can imagine the possibilities of how and begin to replace that gap with our imaginative solutions. And a precursor to this piece is spatial poem number four, Shadow Event from 1971. And Shiomi's spatial poem, which we've already heard about in several fascinating presentations, is a record of nine events taking place over 10 years, involving over 200 international participants. Shiomi sent out instructions to the participants in the post, and then she collated the replies in different forms, including a book with the replies from all the events collected in it. A map is printed on several of the pages and the time that some of the events were carried out is recorded as well in this way, emphasizing boundaries in the different places and time zones that the participants came from. Pages 32 to 33 um, clearly document several photographs from Mayo Hayashi's motorboat journey with the shadow. And one of them is shown here. It's very clear and on the pages you really get a sense of this journey. This is juxtaposed with participants such as Ken Friedman who subversively keeps his activity a secret and Eric Anderson who writes from Copenhagen in the dark. Um, the fact that the participants, although they're spread out geographically, perform the same event in different ways that are then collated in the same book, places them in a common imaginative space for them and us to exist in. And new possibilities of meaning are produced, like entering into a different world or even 
creeping into the boundary. This piece also, an incidental story on the day of a solar eclipse and the night of a lunar eclipse, um, creates a world where there's slippage between what's possible and impossible, and the imagination might be inspired or expanded by the juxtapositions. It's a series of small texts creating a narrative with a theme of alliteration, like the one on the slide, which says, while the pianist was playing the saraband, the strong smell of smoke from the burning antique shop somehow reached a stunned snail, sticking to a slanted swaying spire. And these, um, these small texts are narrated over Bach's partitas from the early 1700s. It's dreamlike, intended to be performed when there's a solar or lunar eclipse, interweaving disparate and unconnected elements of thought. Although Shiomi has fixed the images, there is a space where the sound of the word in each individual image enters the mind, but the meaning of the text is unreal. And it reminds me of the disparate imagery in some surreal art, such as René Magritte's, which um, Shiomi admires. The listener might feel the effect of being transported into a different kind of world where the possibilities of imagination are limitless. Shiomi's pointed out the birth of different harmonies, consonances or dissonances in the piece created by the disparate imagery. And the boundaries of time in the piece are also intertwined. As Shiomi points out, there's the musical time of the part eaters, the natural time of the solar lunar eclipse, and the fictional time of the texts. Um, the sense of these different periods of time might raise our awareness of the different realities in the world, the places where boundaries merge and become intertwined. To come back to the questions posed at the beginning, um, we've looked at how a boundary is a space, an area that can be experienced or a mixing of states. And in these works, we've seen how experiencing boundaries might act to expand our consciousness, um, raise our sense of imagination, awareness and possibility. Thank you for listening.